before we have our uh, devotional and, <clears throat> and then break for our classes, we are going to uh, cover a couple of announcements <clears throat> as well as some prayer requests uh, that we need to mention. Uh, as we have said for the past few weeks, we're still collecting items for camp, uh, and there is a list of those items in the bulletin. Uh, we're also collecting uh, candy-filled Easter eggs uh, for the egg hunt that's coming up soon, uh, and you can put those uh, back in uh, the hallway uh, in a couple of totes that are back there. Uh, there's also a jar in the foyer uh, for you to put your Bible questions or any questions in, uh, because uh, whenever we finish exegesis, we're going to begin a study uh, of those questions, and we're going to be answering um, the questions that y'all have, and I want to know what, what things that you would like to know more about. Uh, we also still need several people to send in pictures for the new online directory, so if you would, uh, log into the directory app on your phone and then submit your picture there. Are there any other announcements that we need to mention? Uh, this upcoming Sunday, uh, I believe it is the 9th, we're going to be having a VBS planning meeting after morning worship services, so if you can uh, be there for that, uh, we'll be able to, to, to get some details worked out on that as well. I have a few prayer requests that we need to mention. Uh, Robbie Jones is recovering from uh, back surgery. She begins uh, physical therapy, and she said six weeks from uh, the day that she had her surgery. Uh, so it'll be coming up in about four or five weeks. So let's be praying for her. Uh, also, my uncle Brent was able to go home. Uh, so prayers of Thanksgiving. Uh, he's uh, still not feeling 100%, but he is recovering. So that's great news there. <clears throat> let's also be praying for Frankie uh, McKellen. And Clellan, as she has a uh, broken hip, so let's pray for her. Uh, also, Josue's uh, aunt's husband, so Anna's husband, uh, is in the hospital with heart problems, and it's not looking uh, very good for him. Uh, so let's definitely remember to be praying uh, for him. Any other prayer requests that we need to mention? Yes, sir. Some progress? Okay. You said this was John Cage's? John Pages. Okay. Okay. So let's definitely be praying for him. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Be praying for Cody as he starts his uh, next round of basic training. Uh, also, um, there are quite a few people that are traveling uh, for spring break and out of town, so let's definitely be praying for them uh, as they uh, are on the road. Any other prayer requests that we need to mention this evening? The devotional for tonight might be a little bit uh, different uh, than, than ones that you've probably heard before. Uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to think about some of the reasons why I love the church. And so I came up with 50. I'm sure there's a lot, lot more than 50, but since we are supposed to have class tonight, it is just going to be a devotional and look at 50 reasons why I love the church. Number one, I love the church because God loved me enough to establish it. Number two, I love the church because Jesus loves the church. The church loves Jesus. The church is a family. The church is filled with true friendship. The church is a source of encouragement. I've seen firsthand the comfort that comes from the church. The church is considerate of other people. The church is a place for the broken. The church is a place for the weak. In the church, I belong to God. The church has perfected potlucks. Jesus is the head of the church. The church is the unified body of Christ. The church helps me to be a better Christian. The church helps me to see my purpose in life. I've met people that have changed my life in the church. The church helps me to love God more. The church is motivated. The church reminds me that this world is not my home. The church shows me the power of song. The church shows me the power of the gospel. 
The church creates a bond that is impossible to find anywhere else. The church shows me how amazing grace really is. The church is a place of spiritual support. The church is a place of physical comfort. And the church is a place of emotional healing. I leave every service feeling renewed. The church helps me to interact better with people. The church at times has helped me practice patience. The church is a reminder that we are equal in Christ. The church is a place filled with servants. The church helps bring out the best in me. I love the church because I want to go to heaven. The church helps me glorify God. The church is the family I worship God with. The church is exciting. The church is where I belong. I can't imagine life without the church. Church puts my focus where it belongs, on God and other people. The church is selfless. The church is life-changing. God wants me to love the church. The church makes you feel needed. The church makes me more considerate of others. I want to be a part of God's plan. The church helped me to be closer to my physical family. The church gives me memories that will last a lifetime. The church is filled with people that I will never have to say goodbye to. And the church of Christ helps me keep heaven in view. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. If you're here tonight and you want to be added to this beautiful church, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Also, if you're in the high school class, you will be joining us in the auditorium this evening. Good evening. So last week we began looking at the nine steps for New Testament exegesis. Uh, and as we were going through those first couple of steps, we didn't get through all nine at all. We got through two. Uh, and so we're going to continue looking at those nine steps this evening. Uh, but can anyone remember what we looked at or talked about last week?
Okay, learn to think in terms of uh, entire books. And we went to uh, the book of James as an illustration. We looked at James chapter 1 and how every subject that's mentioned in James chapter 1 is also mentioned in James chapter 5. Uh, and so think in terms of the big picture, and then we looked even bigger at the Bible itself and how Genesis and Revelation also share a lot of similarities uh, in what is being written and said about creation. So we looked at learning to think in terms of the entire book that will help us when it comes to uh, seeing what the author's intention was in writing those letters. But what else do we look at? Okay, uh, we looked at key words and specifically how those play into the purpose of the book. So we went through three Ps. Uh, and so we looked at purpose statements, prayers, uh, petition verbs. We looked at the book of Philippians and how petition verbs uh, are a automatic sign that when you read a petition verb, that is going to be a, a key topic or subject or even the purpose of the entire book. Uh, and then we also looked at a, uh, the prevalence of words and how that will shape the meaning of a book. Any questions or comments about what we studied last week? Okay, so tonight I am super, super excited. This is uh, probably uh, one of my favorite uh, points here that we're going to be looking at. We're going to try and cover uh, as much as we can without getting uh, too bog down or, or go into too many rabbit chases, but you are going to need your Bible tonight. Uh, we're going to be doing some practicing uh, tonight with some New Testament exegesis. We're going to do it together on the board and then look at several examples uh, as well. So what we're going to be doing uh, first, before we get into that, is we're going to try and uh, give some more background into uh, New Testament exegesis by looking at step number three. Studying important words. Uh, now, this one is extremely, extremely valuable to know. And, and really, there's not much that we can do with just our Bibles. If you're confused by a word, uh, you're going to need uh, a dictionary. You're going to need a, a lexicon to help with understanding those words. Uh, now, there's a couple of ones that you can use uh, if you're taking notes. Strong's Complete Word Study Concordance. Vine's Concordance, you probably know that one. That's a good one. Uh, Bible study concordance of the Greek New Testament and, of course, Logos Bible software. Uh, if you want more sources for that, just come to me afterwards. But those are really good uh, for studying important words. But a common mistake that people will do in studying words in the Bible is they will get a lexicon. Do y'all say lexicon or lexicon? Lexicon? Okay. You get a lexicon and you get your dictionary, and you get your concordance, and then you'll open up to a verse, and then you'll start just picking out words and trying to study them and see what they mean. That's going to be uh, really not the best way to do it, because you'll get drowned out in information. You won't really be able to grasp the whole picture because you'll be looking at every single word. Instead, save those concordances, those studies for churchy words. What are churchy words? Be words like... Repentance, okay. Uh, you could say purloining, or um, the providence actually isn't even found in the Bible unless you're looking at the New King James, but you could also look at propitiation, justification, sanctification. Baptism is another one that's transliterated, so it's taken directly from the Greek and given English words. And so save that studying for those words that you actually have to kind of stop and go, what does that mean? If you don't know what a word means, then you can't grasp what the author is saying in that verse, in that chapter, and in that book. And so be sure to use it uh, properly. Uh, but also, consider other uses of those words. So if you're confused by righteousness, for example, if you're uh, not familiar with, it can actually mean something entirely different depending on who's writing and also what they're talking about. For example, turn to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, the word righteousness refers to something that God does. Something that He performs for man. So in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, and especially in chapter uh, 4 and verse 6 of the book of Romans, we read how God shows His righteousness towards people. It's an act or a deed that He does. But then we look over in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, and that word righteousness 
has to do with something that man does. And so two different uses of the word, but it's the same word. So keep in mind what's being said in the context of that author. But also, turn one chapter back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28. And Jimmy, if you would, read Romans 3, 28. Okay, so there is a, a big argument that is brought up when you look at the book of James compared to the book of Romans. Because Paul in Romans, especially in Romans chapter 3 and verse 28, as well as chapter 4 and verse 5, he says you're saved by faith and not by your deeds or by your works. But then we go to James chapter 2, I believe it's verse 22 through 24 around there, and James says that you are not saved unless you have works. And so people will be like, okay, well, who's right? Is it James or is it Paul? What would you say to that? They're both right, which is true if we believe in God's Word being accurate and not contradictory. But how do we know that they're both right? Okay. But in uh, Romans, he says, Paul says actually that uh, works do, don't do save. It's faith and not your, your deeds that you perform. And so, how do you respond to that? They do. That's exactly right. And, and really, again, it all goes back to context. Uh, and it's kind of unfair to just throw a verse at you and say, without any context, this is what this means. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. And those works are based on your faith. Now, when we look at the context of Romans, do you have something? I was going to say baptism is the same thing. Uh, the immersion into water does not save you. You know, just the act itself. I mean, anybody can take a dunk in the water. Yep. But it's, you know, it, it's the, the repentance, the confession, and then the act of submission of being buried in that water because it's symbolic. It, you, know, yep. you know, like I say, anybody can hop in a river or a lake or a creek or something and, and get wet. Was it uh, King Nebuchadnezzar that had leprosy in the Old Testament and he was told to go dip in the uh, Jordan seven times? Is that Naaman? What did I say? Nebuchadnezzar? Naaman. Uh, and how he said, you know, this is dumb. I could just go bathe in this river. If God never told him to get in that river and dip seven times and he did anyway, would he still have leprosy? Yeah, he would have. God was the reason that that happened, and he obeyed and followed through with that. Again, uh, that phrase, it's not the water, it's the one that told me to get into the water that saves. And so keeping that in mind, as well as the context of Romans chapter 3, Paul is basically saying, you have the wrong mindset. You're trying to work towards your salvation just like you would work towards saving for your dream car. That's not how it works. There's not going to be deeds or some kind of merit that is, that is won by those works. It's obedience. And then we look at James, and he's referring to works that demonstrate the existence of your faith. Abraham, Rahab, and he uses those illustrations there as well. So keep in mind that context in those books will help us to, to kind of define those words as well. Let's look at uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16. John chapter 3 and verse 16, a pretty well-known verse. In fact, I think most of us would probably be able to uh, quote it because we've heard it so many times. John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. It's a very powerful verse in and of itself. God loved the world, so what is He going to do? He's going to take His only Son that He loves more than anything, and he's going to send it down and have him crucified for us. Already a powerful verse, already shows us the love of God. But I want to ask a question. What kind of world did God love? Look at John chapter 1 and verse 10. John chapter 1 and verse 10. Again, context of looking at John, he's already used this word world before. 
And we look at John chapter 1 and verse 10 and notice what it says. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So we have the Son of God that was sent to the world, to a world that didn't even know him, even though he is the creator of the world. And so as we're looking at this, this idea of context, we can really start to form a picture, a more complete picture of what these words actually mean, especially when you put into uh, and keep in consideration just how the world was acting as we see from uh, the book of Romans. Any questions or comments? So I know that uh, the, the Greek, knowing the Greek, learning Greek and being able to study that does help. Uh, but I do want to mention just one, one more time before we move on to step number four. Uh, I would suggest using uh, more than one translation if you're not going to be looking at any of those concordances, uh, just because it will help to give a fuller picture, uh, just because some translations will change. So some good New Testament translations would be the ASV, uh, the RSV, uh, the New King James and the ESV, as well as the New American Standard 95 uh, update. Any questions or comments before we move on to step four? Okay, step number four. Putting your keywords into action. Put your keywords into action. This is where we are going to do some uh, whiteboard, and everyone is going to help me with Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. What we're trying to do with keywords is we're trying to turn our Bibles into an exegetical study Bible. Uh, some people, and these are some things that you want to avoid, is if you are marking in your Bible, avoid taking the highlighter and just highlighting everything on one page. If you have a Bible that's just filled with one color, those things that you're trying to get to stand out come off the page, or you aren't going to see them. And so save the, the highlighting complete verses for just the purpose statements or prayers, or petition uh, verses that have petition verbs in them, uh, because that's the way they would have seen it in the original manuscripts. Okay, this is not going to be how everyone does this, uh, but this is my approach. I find it to be uh, as simple uh, as it needs to be to where we can still get everything that we need to out of the verse. But step number one if you look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, if we had time, it would be to read the book of Colossians uh, to learn about uh, who they are, uh, what their past has been like, what they've been uh, going through, who's writing to them, and, and of course, all those details as well. But someone read, uh, actually, Chris, why don't you go ahead and read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Okay, this is uh, the English Standard Version. That's what that's on the board right there. Uh, um, if, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. If you were trying to learn more about this section of Scripture, what would you do? What would you do to try and learn more about this? these few verses? Okay, cross-reference. See if you can find some other uh, occurrences of some of these words that are brought up. Okay, what else? What else will we do? This is what I do. Uh, not really a, universal, a universally accepted approach, but I do uh, think that it is the most simple way to approach this is, number one, to look for your main subjects in the verse. Look for your main subjects. Who are the main subjects here? Christ. Christ. Okay. How many times does it occur? How many times? Okay. Three times in four verses. Right off the bat, that is going to be a key word. Who's the other subject? I did miss one. 
It's a little low. <laughs> okay? Four times. Four times in four verses, which means he is going to be the key in this section of Scripture. Who else is the subject? You. Happens quite a bit. And the you here is talking about the church in Colossae. How many times is you or your in this verse? Making sure I'm not missing any here. I believe it is five. Okay, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Fifteen. Fifteen times in four verses. Okay. So we have Christ. We have the you, which is talking to the church in Colossae. But that's actually, since it's under the new covenant, again, keeping the dispensation in mind, where it falls under, who it's being applied to, the New Testament is written for us. And so this you is a direct command to us. And so the first step that I normally do in uh, breaking this down is I circle all the main subjects who's talked about, and of course, uh, Christ and the, the Colossians were the main subjects here, also known as us. Second step, any questions or comments on the first one? Okay, second step. What is the subject told to do? Okay. Okay, so step two is to set your minds on the things that are above. Does that phrase, that phrase sound familiar? Verse one, seek the things that are above. Again, that phrase appears again. And then he gives a contrast. So he says, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above. And then he says what? Not, not things that are on the earth. So we're given two main commands here. And that is think about heaven and not about this world. Okay. What else are we told to do? Any other repeated phrases that you see? Okay, so we have appear, and then we also have appear, but we also have the word in verse 3, hidden. So you're starting to see a little bit of a, a visual uh, description of what Christ has done for us. And so he says, your life is hidden in Christ, and then once the person is appearing or is revealed that has hidden your life, that has taken away all of those blemishes, once He appears, then you will also appear with Him. Yeah. And see, I didn't even notice that the first time I went through here. Hidden. And so we have some connections that are starting to be made in this verse. Any other repeated phrases or words? You notice what He says in verse 4? as well as verse 3, two words in the same order. What does he say? He says, your life in verse 3 and your life in verse 4. What is he talking about in regards to our life? What is he talking about? He says, your life is what? hidden with Christ in God. And then he says, when Christ, who is now what? Your life. What does it mean to have Christ as your life? <coughs> what does that mean about your decisions? You're a part of the body, and if Christ is now everything that you are concerned about, and you're not thinking about things that are on this earth, you're thinking about things that are above, what is Christ then going to do in your life? He's going to change it. 
He's going to make it to where you no longer are living like the world and focusing on those things that have no importance. Step number three, compare translations. Who has a King James Version? Who has New King James? Okay, read New King James. Okay, there are several distinctions that are made between the New King James and the ESV. Did you notice any of them? What are some differences that you saw? Anything meaningful? Normally, and I'll say this real quick, normally whenever I'm doing this, I'll have three or four Bibles up because a lot of times if you do have a, a confusing word, another translation will clarify that. Uh, but it's interesting to note the differences between the, the translations and just how clear it becomes. Uh, I think I already mentioned this, but we're, we're studying through uh, the, the Old Testament, Emily and I are, and I realize just how different it sounds when you read it in a different translation. The only translation I had used up until this year for the Old Testament when I was reading through it was the New American Standard. And I read it through in the ESV, and it seems like a completely different story. Like it's different words, different phrases, the way that they describe things are different. And so looking at those different translations will definitely help when trying to understand uh, these, these verses. But the differences between the New King James and the ESV are, are several. In fact, a lot of the phrasing and the grammar is different as well. And, and one of the best things to do with these different translations is to look for the breakdowns, how they, they structure those verses and how it's laid out on the page, even just as you see right here, changing the verses to where they're all lined up like this will help you to make connections that you never would have noticed before. And so what I did was actually I print off that section of scripture on a piece of paper and I line it up just like this so that I can visualize and see those connections uh, that are there. And so that the way this starts, though, this is a first class conditional if, which is translated as since. Is that a big deal? Does that mean a lot? Does that change the meaning? Instead of if you've been raised, he's saying since. So he's talking to Christians, Christians who are focused on the world. And so he tells them, here's the things that you need to do. Set your heart or seek the things that are above. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the earth, because there's a reason. You've died. You are no longer the same that you were before you met Christ. And so he, he talks about really um, how the things of the earth are able to distract people from their purpose. And then in step four, there's several things that you can do. I look for motivations or reasons behind the command. Uh, so look for motivations. Do you see any motivations for uh, the command that'll make it easier to not set your mind on things that are on the earth? You see any encouragement, any motivation? You'll be raised with him when he is revealed. Okay. Oh, I was looking for the one in verse one to connect. Okay. Yeah, that's different. Okay. So up here. What'd you say? All this is going to be added to you if you stay faithful. And like Mike said, you know, when life is over, we're going to appear with him. Yep. And, and, and talk about a motivation to actually listen to the command that's given. Uh, and so if you're looking at raised and how you have uh, died, you are no longer 
your own master. You've been hidden in Christ, but one day you're going to appear with Christ because you have been hidden. You have been raised up with Him. You have died. And then since you follow the same exact steps that Christ went through, guess what? The same thing that's going to happen to Christ, how He's going to be revealed in glory, we are too. And so looking for those motivations and how you have been raised and how you have died to your life, how you're hidden in Christ and how your life is going to, you're going to appear with Christ in glory. And so finally, as we are looking at the full picture, and this is a little messier than it is in my Bible. In fact, I have one uh, right here that looks a little bit better. It helps to use different colors. I only had three dry erase markers, so you know, I couldn't mix colors there. But what you're trying to do is not just highlight the whole thing. You're trying to distinguish the different subjects, who's being talked about, the reason for why you listen to the command, and then you're able to piece together between all of it how verse 1 fits with verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with Him in glory. If then you have been hidden in Christ, seek the thing. So he starts off by saying you're hidden, but then you're going to appear with Christ if you set your mind on heaven. Uh, and so that's really one way that you can break it down. And every time you go back to this verse, you'll be able to see those connections and see how it, the, the structure through there is continually talking about you and how, how we as Christians are going to be able to experience this uh, with Christ. So that's really a basic structure uh, of what uh, I normally do whenever I am breaking down uh, a text. Any questions or comments? Does anyone, can you, uh, can someone grab me one of those erasers for the board? Do you know, I don't, I think there's one in my office. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples here that we can go to and try and, and figure this out a little bit more. After you have done a paragraph-by-paragraph paragraph analysis, there's a couple of questions that you can ask after you've done this. What is the main thought in the paragraph? How does the paragraph advance the author's argument or point? How does the paragraph prepare us for the next paragraph? And how does it lead into the next section? And so we really, what we're trying to do is, is take it in in bite-sized chunks, not just read all the way through it, and then just try and skim through and get some stuff that, that stands out to us. If we actually sit down and dig into Scripture, we start to find some incredible and amazing things that God has done for us. And so uh, we really need to keep that in mind as we're studying. Someone tell me, um, what are some ways that you can take God's Word and make it come to life? Okay, put yourself into the story. Could you put your name here? Would that make it more personal? You know, a lot of times I'll go through a verse and I'll change it from you and your to me. Since I have been raised and since we, thank you so much. Since we have been given that incredible blessing of, is anyone still copying this? Okay, I have a, I have a way better copy that's not on a whiteboard that I can give you after class if you would like to have it. But that really is just the, the, the bottom line of studying like this is you're trying to find those connections and you're trying to make it personal. And the more you do this, the more it comes to life because then you're starting to read the way that the original audience was reading. And then you'll start to, to grasp the things and, and understand the culture and context and time period that they're living in and just how important it was for them to receive this kind of blessing after the old law. We're going to do uh, another one here. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 18 through 21. And Sean, if you would read that. Okay. 
It is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Okay, how many of you have heard that verse before? Raise your hand. You know, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go here and we'll use this section of Scripture to talk about instrumental music. I'm not saying that you don't want to use that verse for that topic, but there is a much deeper and much more profound meaning to this section of Scripture. He's talking about how we are to be filled with the Spirit. That is the command here. And so, in fulfilling that command, what are we supposed to do? How are we to be filled with the Spirit? I'll give you a hint. There are four of them. He says four words that we are to follow if we want to be filled with the Spirit. They all... Okay, so we're supposed to be speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. How does that fill us with the Spirit? It gets you in the right mindset. And a lot of times, those songs that we sing are talking about Christ. They're talking about Scripture. And you are filling yourself. You're feeding on the spiritual diet that God has given to us. And so, uh, you sp- you, to be filled with the Spirit, number one, you want to be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Okay? So that first command is to speak. And then he branches out and he says psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what you're to be speaking if you want to be filled with the Spirit. The second one, the second um, participle is singing. After you have finished speaking, you are to sing to with one another and to one another in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the next one is what? Give thanks. Giving thanks, I believe it is. Uh, I believe that's the fourth one. There's another one before that. Making melody. Making melody in your heart. So again, he specifies how you're to make melody. In your heart. I'm just going to draw a heart here. A very terrible heart because that's really low down there. Looks more like a jelly bean. Uh, Okay, so you're supposed to be making melody with your heart to who? Does it specify? To the Lord. So when we sing, we don't sing because we want to, you know, make it sound good. We don't want to be singing, trying to figure out what the notes are going to go next. What we're trying to do is make a melody in our heart to God. That is why we do that. And in doing so, we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fourth one is giving thanks. Does it specify on what you're supposed to give thanks for? All things. What things do you think he's talking about? All of them. Especially the things that come in the Spirit. See, when we read in the New Testament especially... Most of the time, what is going to take place is you are going to read a command, and then as soon as you read a command, start looking for how you fulfill the command. You know, my parents would, the first time I ever went and tried to wash the baseboards or tried to dust, my mom showed me how it was done. She didn't just throw me a rag and some of that furniture polish and say, dust. She had to show me. She's like, no, you move the picture frame, you go behind it, then you set it back down, you don't go around it. You know, She gave me the whole spiel. Whenever you read in your Bible a command like be filled with the Spirit, you don't just sit there and then, you know, God goes, all right, be filled with the Spirit. He gives us directions. He tells us how. And then specifically here with Paul, especially, he always gives a list of participles or uh, he'll go through and kind of explain just what he's trying to get across so that we're not confused. Any questions or comments? Philippians 4.13 
four eight, you know, meditate on these things, things that encourage us to stay spiritually minded. Well, and, and, and one of those reasons that we, we do that, like you're saying, is that it leads to, to growth. And also, songs get stuck in your head. I mean, I can't tell you how many times throughout a day I'll be singing a church song because it'll get stuck in my head and then I can't get rid of it. Kind of a good thing to get stuck in your head, if you ask me. Uh, and so he, he gives this reason for uh, why you are to do all of these different commands, why we sing the way we do, and, the, the, and that the, all of it goes back to being filled with the Spirit. Do you have a question? You just, okay. All right. There's a lot that you can do just by breaking down the text uh, without even getting into any studying. We didn't look at any of the words. All we were trying to do, and I know, again, I have a, one that I actually did on a piece of paper. Once I get lower, I can't really control everything as well, you know, so it kind of, it, I, I guess the whole thing doesn't really, we'll just... That's right. That's what it is. I'm wearing boots. You know, otherwise that board would look amazing. Uh, but if you do want to see a more detailed version of what's on the board, uh, or if you would like to even be able to understand what's on the board, talk to me after class and I'll show you hopefully uh, one that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, we're not going to automatically know how to obey the command. And that's the bottom line. The participles and the, uh, the, the different lists that come after a command are explaining, all pointing back to the command that was given. So look for those connections because it'll really help us uh, with our study. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I believe we have enough time for, for one more. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And Troy, if you have that, if you wouldn't mind reading that. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. Do you notice a word as you were reading that that appeared over and over and over and over? I'll give you a hint. It ends in ing again. What's the word? Does anyone have the word having in their Bible? ESV and New King James both say having. And a lot of times, that's a word we don't pay attention to, but it breaks down the text for us. For example, the, what Paul is talking about here, beginning of verse 13, he says, you were dead in your trespasses, and then Christ made you alive. And so we ask the question, how did he make us alive? And look at the list that is laid out, starting after verse 13. He says, first of all, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. So basically, having forgiven... The next one, having canceled, having nailed, having disarmed, and having triumphed. How are we made alive in Christ? And then he'll go on to explain all the ways that Christ, in his service, in his uh, rejection by man, in his life on earth, and in his willingness to leave heaven, made us alive. And so he explains it and he breaks it down. So what did Christ nail to the cross? Well, our transgressions. Our, our sins, the, the things that separated us from Christ. Any questions or comments? Are you seeing the pattern, though? Do you see how it is broken down? And, and a lot of times, those patterns, especially if you see that same word, is going to be expounding upon something or someone that the author has mentioned just before. I think we have about five minutes, so uh, let's, look at, um, let's look at one more this evening. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and read that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verses 11 and 12. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each, uh, each one of you and encouraged you and char charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Okay, several participle here is dependent several participles in this verse here, depending on what translation you're using. Uh, but you'll notice that he says, as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring. He de he's describing three of the main actions that they as apostles were doing around the Thessalonians. And he says that they exhorted, they encouraged, and they implored, or they commanded them, or they uh, wanted them to do what? Why did they do those three things? Exhort, encourage, and implore. So that you would walk worthy of God. So this all goes back to basically the kind of example that you set for others. In fact, Paul says we did all of that so that you could be more like Christ. Actions speak louder than words. The things that Paul and the apostles were doing were all done so that they would walk worthy, so that they would be saved, that they would be a part of the church. And they showed them not with teaching and, and beating them with a Bible, but by showing them how it's done. And so what we learn from this is that we can exhort, encourage, and implore our own brothers and sisters so that we all will walk in a manner that is worthy of God, so that we'll all be a part of God's family. Any questions or comments? It is a lifestyle. And, and, and really, a lifestyle that's not just, uh, you know, Sunday and Wednesday night. It's, it's something that we continually do. And that's why Paul was able to say, my actions towards you whenever I came were done so that you'd have the desired outcome. If we keep that in mind in our everyday decisions, that our actions could lead other people to be walking in a manner worthy of God, that should change our behavior and the way that we act around not only our brothers and sisters, but those that could potentially begin to walk with Christ. Uh, I believe that is a good place to end for tonight. We have uh, a minute and 17 seconds left until class is over. So I figured instead of jumping into another one of these verses, uh, we can go ahead and end there this evening. Uh, any questions or comments? you got about a minute and eight seconds. Well, and that's the, that's the, the thing that Paul's trying to say is it wasn't just that we were preaching at you. We were living it so that you would be able to actually benefit from it and just imitate our actions. And again, goes back to whenever my mom would dust, I would watch her dust and then I would know how to do it because I watched her actions. She didn't just say, you're going to want to move this and then you know start dusting. She said, here, I'll show you. And then I was able to see firsthand her actions. And that really helped. Not just with dusting, but for walking with God. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? That's right. Our actions, our words uh, don't really, uh, they can't hurt. Words can hurt, depending on what you say, but most of the time, actions are what really do uh, more damage than anything. All right, we're going to end there. I believe we got through four, three, three points tonight. So uh, one better than last week, and we'll be hopefully wrapping up uh, Biblical Exegesis next Wednesday. Thank you guys for your attention.